Ah, hello, a warm welcome again um, to Master the Art of Diplomacy, uh, insights from a former British ambassador. Today's webinar is just a, maybe a quick um, information before we start. Today's webinar will last for 40 minutes, um, plus there will be a Q&A session. Um, the webinar is in listen-only mode, so you can hear us but we cannot hear you. Um, you can, of course, use the chat if you have any questions. You can use the chat during the webinar, um, and you can also ask your questions and post them in the chat um, during the presentation. Um, for you to know, this webinar will be recorded. Um, however, do not worry. You can only see myself and Ambassador Tor Turner at the webinar. So don't worry. I appreciate a lot of people have logged in from all over the globe. So if you're still in your pajamas or already in your pajamas, us. Don't worry. Um, we will only see you will only see the two faces of us and um, no other um, no other um, video recording here. Um, quickly, let me introduce myself. Um, I will be your host today. My name is Stephanie. Um, I have worked for the United Nations for almost a decade before I founded UCC, the United Career Coalition. Um, I have worked for a specialized UN organization in the headquarters, as well as for the former director general of the IEA and Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Um, I had the honor to travel around the globe and having met um, senior UN officials such as Kofi Annan, um, statesmen and presidents of various countries, and saw firsthand the great opportunity um, the UN um, offers as a career, as an international career. And my goal with uh, my team at the United Career Coalition is to help you and to help as many as possible to achieve your global career goals. Um, with that said, let me introduce today's special guest speaker, Ambassador Turner. Um, I will share a bit more details about um, Ambassador Turner, but this is just a short introduction. Um, Ambassador Turner is a respected and um, former senior British diplomat with decades of diplomatic experience, including as an ambassador to Austria and Ukraine. He is also a Financial Times journalist and he is an author. Um, his latest books are, um, Ambassador, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's a Blood Summit and um, the Seven Hotel Stories, which are both, I think, available on Amazon. And I will promise to share all the links together with this recording um, after the webinar. Um, a very warm welcome, Ambassador, and thank you for joining, um, joining today's webinar. Great to be here, and I look forward to saying a few words later. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think I've covered um, all the information on the webinar today. Um, this brings me to my next slide, um, a quick overview of the United Career Coalition. Um, what is the United Career Coalition? It's um, basically, it's a platform um, of UN insiders offering their advice um, for uh, on interviews, on uh, the recruitment process and um, different, um, basically the, the whole um, components that come with applying for the UN. Um, applying for the UN is, uh, can sometimes be a lengthy and cumbersome process. So we try to offer advice here through um, different, um, different services we offer, by cover letter guides, um, through um, getting in touch with UN insiders and having um, direct video calls with them. Um, so there are various services which I will cover in a moment, but it's um, basically a platform that enables you um, to connect and network um, with UN experts um, that work in various UN organizations around the globe. So this already brings me to the overview. Um, UCC support at a glance, as I've already mentioned, um, you can um, speak to a UN expert um, through a 45 minute video call. Um, you can ask any UN related or career, international career related question you may have. Um, and um, this is um, can be booked through the United Career Coalition website. You can also download our 20 page cover letter guide, which um, also has a sample cover letter um, that is drafted also by our UN experts and um, should help you. Um, make sure that you use the right keywords, that you use um, the right U kind of UN language and give you a bit of an idea how to structure a cover letter um, for the UN. I will just stop here for a second and admit um, some remaining participants who joined now. 
wonderful. Um, and then we have, of course, learning via webinars. So webinars like um, this webinar today, um, some of them are for free, some of them are paid webinars, um, depending, um, uh, depending on the content and on the length of the webinar. Um, so far, um, most of our webinars were um, offered for free in order to give you the opportunity, everyone the opportunity to um, speak to ambassadors, to speak to UN insiders. And there are, we cover various different topics. We had a webinar on cover letters, a webinar on networking, um, a webinar on uh, with a former ambassador um, of Albania about diplomatic skills. So um, really very different webinars in different, um, different areas that should help you to, again, network and connect with, um, with experts. Um, great, this already brings me to today's webinar. The objective, um, very short, is to provide exclusive insights on what qualities and skills are essential for a successful international career, and um, more importantly, also how to develop them. Um, you get your opportunity also to um, ask your questions or get your questions answered by an author, former British ambassador and financial times journalist today. Um, so, um, before I hand over to Ambassador Turner, um, I want to cover um, some um, UN related input on diplomatic related to diplomatic skills or international skills. Um, as we already shared in um, when we promoted the webinar, um, language is not only an instrument of communication, but it's really the very essence of diplomacy. Um, diplomats every day engage in meetings, negotiations, presentations, all of which um, have to, all of which um, it, um, definitely um, require um, effective communication skills. So this is our focus today, these diplomatic skills that are needed for a global career. But these skills are, um, for those of you who are not yet diplomats or amb and ambassadors, um, these skills are also needed um, while you're studying. These skills are needed um, after you have just left university. It's extremely important, for example, to present your skills um, and choose the right words, for example, when crafting your cover letters or at an interview. We have a whole webinar, for example, which is focusing on um, essential skills and how you choose the right words and use UN action keywords and how you present those at the at a competency based UN interview or in your cover letter. So um, using the right words and phrases um, can really have a um, surprisingly um, powerful impact. So um, let's look at those um, competencies. Um, for those of you um, who are interested in a career with the United Nations system, uh, some of you might already be familiar, familiar with those um, UN core values and the UN core competencies. So um, depending on what role you apply at the UN, you want to highlight different UN core competencies. The UN values in general apply for all roles, but the UN core values, uh, UN core competencies, they differentiate. Um, so let's say you apply for a professional um, P5 role, that's a more senior role, then you would, would, would want to highlight more managerial skills. Um, you want to showcase um, that you are, um, that, that, that you are um, a good supervisor, that you have leadership skills, that you have good negotiation skills, for example. If you apply for a more junior role, Role, you might want to focus on skills such as um, multicultural team working skills, communication skills, um, but um, any um, or in general um, about uh, you want to highlight transferable skills um, that are related to client orientation, planning and organizing. For uh, often, I get asked um, when when you when you look at those core competences, the, I get asked, well, you know, wouldn't you need for um, for UN role more specialized skills? And um, some people say, well, communication skills and teamwork skills, kind of everyone has those skills. But it's really um, it's really important to understand how vital those soft skills are for a role at the UN. You have to understand. Um, what, uh, how the UN culture works, how the UN family works. And these skills are really, really important. Um, I will not read out all of them, but I think what I would like to focus on today is um, 
on the communication skill, skills. So here, how to communicate um, with tact and diplomacy. Um, so I'll just admit more um, participants. Um, here, just a couple of um, examples, some advice. Um, for example, say the right thing at the right time, aiming to strengthen relationships, understand the feelings, ideas, and beliefs and opinions of others. So be empathetic, um, put yourself in the shoes of the other person. That is also very important if you um, apply for your end roles. My advice here is always try to understand the role, try to understand what HR and the hiring manager is looking for in a candidate. A lot of times, one of the mistakes that candidates do is they write very emotional, almost um, unprofessional motivational cover letters um, that, more, that focus more on their motivation to work for the UN rather than on, which is, which is good to mention, of course, and which is natural if you reply for the, for the role. But um, equally important, and if not more important, is that you really mention those specific skills that are needed for, for that specific role you apply for. Um, but enough from my side on diplomatic and uh, communication skills and on negotiation skills. Um, I think the best person you can, you can speak to and who can share some advice today is our special guest speaker. Um, as I promised, um, a bit of a longer introduction here. So as I said already, Ambassador Turner's career spans senior positions in government. Um, he served among others as ambassador to Austria and Ukraine. Um, in business, Ambassador Turner is a journalist um, writing for the Financial Times and a full-time author. Um, his latest books I've already mentioned, it's The Blood Summit and The Seven Hours Hotel. And as I also promised, maybe again here for those who joined a bit later, we will share um, the link to his blog, his books and the Amazon page um, when we share this webinar recording in the next newsletter that we will send out. Um, Ambassador Turner was educated at Cambridge and graduated in geography, and he was focusing on human ge geography and how people are influenced by their environments. Um, extremely interesting. Um, I will, um, yeah, I will hope Ambassador Turner will share also some of his personal stories today, today and how his career started. So maybe we hear a bit more about um, about that as well. And um, with that said, um, I'm really excited to hear um, Ambassador's exclusive insights today on what skills are um, essential for a successful international career. And before I hand over, again, a warm welcome to everyone who joined today's webinar and to our special guest speaker. And um, also a special thanks for volunteering today to be our special guest. And um, with that said, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to you, Ambassador Turner. Maybe, um, maybe you want to share some exciting things you're currently working on before we start with the questions. Sure, thank you very much, Stephanie. And um, thank you for the invitation to speak to your, your invited guests today. And greetings to all of you who are listening. I hope you can hear me fine. Uh, if you can't hear me or if you can't see me, say so in the chat and I'm sure Stephanie can work that out. So what am I working on today at the moment? I'm writing a book about diplomacy. It's going to be called A Hitchhiker's Guide to Diplomacy. And um, I think it's going to be a great read. It's based on my 12 diplomatic lessons, which are reflections on a career of working in the diplomatic service in lots of countries around the world. And they're all reproduced on my LinkedIn page. So if you go to my LinkedIn page, you can find my 12 um, diplomatic lessons, one for each of the jobs I've done. I noticed that one of the questions that Stephanie suggested to me was that many people these days have 12 jobs on average throughout their careers. And what does that mean for diplomacy? And certainly one of the remarkable things about diplomacy is that you do tend to work in a series of different jobs. And I've, I've been lucky enough to work all over the world uh, with the British Diplomatic Service, including three heads of mission jobs in Kiev, in Istanbul, and in Vienna. Now, what about these skills? Um, in some countries, they will be different from other countries. So in some countries, such as Germany, 
um, you need to be a lawyer really to become a, a, a diplomat. Um, in other countries such as the UK, there are no prerequisites. And indeed in Germany, they're trying to become more general. For me, the key skills really are that you are fascinated by other countries and by other cultures. It sounds obvious, doesn't it? But not all diplomats are. Some diplomats are more at home sitting in their offices in front of their computers. And I don't think they're the best diplomats. It's also worth bearing in mind that um, not all of the work that you do as a diplomat is about foreign affairs. It tends to be to do with places in other countries, but it's not necessarily the high politics of relationships between your countries and other countries. Many of the jobs that you will do as diplomats, including in the UN, will be, for example, economic jobs or jobs connected with science or law enforcement. Um, or in, a, in an embassy, you might be doing consular work or commercial work. None of these things are what we commonly understand as being foreign policy, but they are very important. And it's worth remembering that you, whatever your background and whatever your skills, will have skills that will suit you to a job in diplomacy or in the UN. If you look at diplomatic lesson number 12, um, I say, what makes a good diplomat? And I say three things. Um, first of all, to be a good diplomat, you must be expert in whatever you're doing. So if you're, for example, the desk officer for France, you need to know absolutely everything about France, um, from top to bottom, everything about its culture, its system of government, its politicians, the country, etc. If you're in an economic section, you need to know everything about economics. Whatever it is, you need to be an expert. So that's number one, if you're a diplomat. Number two is you need to have the skill to communicate with other people, to listen to them, and to learn from them. In other words, I said earlier that a good diplomat is not someone who sits in his office all the time. Similarly, a good diplomat is somebody who gets out there who meets people, who cultivates people, who listens to them. And finally, and this fits in with the first two things, so if the first one is that you should be an expert, and the second one is that you should meet people and listen to them, the third thing to be a good, good diplomat is to take your time. I'm deliberately pausing there. I'm taking my time, okay? In this age of social media, there is a terrible pressure to make decisions instantly, to decide instantly, to send that text immediately. And when Talleyrand, famous French diplomat said, pas trop de zèle, so don't rush too much to young French diplomats, he had a point. You need to think before you decide to take your time. So those would be my three tips for definite skills that you need in every country to be a good diplomat. Back to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Ambassador, um, for sharing those insights. It's extremely, um, extremely useful for us to, I think there are a lot of young people today at the webinar, a lot of um, young students. And we had um, a webinar with, um, with an ambassador, as I mentioned before, um, Dr. Lanzmann, ambassador of, uh, former ambassador of Albania a couple of months ago. And he also mentioned about social media and about um, how the role of the ambassador has changed with that as well. And in general, everyone's life and everyone's career. So um, thank you again for mentioning that. And I think this is a really great advice to think before you decide and um, to have these active listening skills and listen carefully and go out there and listen to people, talk to people, interact. And I think um, a lot of times, um, maybe when we re to relate this also with uh, to the UN career, a lot of times um, uh, people are afraid to take the step to go out to approach people. And but this is part of networking and um, it's part of joining those kind of webinars. It's a part of connecting with, um, with people who work at the UN and get their insights and get their advice. And um, my recommendation is, is always go, go out and ask and don't be shy and um, just, just give it a go. Um, 
So thank you very much for, for that. I will um, I will also share, I just thought I would also share the specific link to the post um, where you share your um, diplomatic lessons in the newsletter. I took a note um, to that and we share that as well in the next newsletter. Um, I, know, I noticed, by the way, a couple of people are saying they're going to LinkedIn to friend, friend me or follow me. That sounds, uh, sounds good to me, you're all very welcome. Wonderful. Um, Ambassador, would you like to um, maybe um, answer some of the questions? Um, feel free to, to pick one, there's no, no specific sure. order. Um, I have sure. a, a question as well. Um, we have gathered some questions from social media, but maybe um, if you pick one of the questions that are here on the slide and um, if you want okay. to answer them. Thank you very much. So um, just as an example of how things these days go too quickly, and how you need to resist this. I always give the example of Robin Cook, who was a former foreign secretary of the Labour government from 1997 onwards. And Robin Cook was a, a great foreign secretary, a very intelligent man, um, and he had an affair with his secretary. And um, this was discovered by the newspapers. And the number 10 press office, so the press office of the prime minister, um, got in touch with Robin Cook and said, you have half an hour to decide whether you're going to go back to your wife and stop this affair with your secretary, or whether you're going to go with your secretary and make her your new wife and divorce your old wife, um, because anything else is bad for our party. And poor Robin Cook had to decide in half an hour. In fact, he decided to continue his relationship with his secretary. And for me, that's an example of unreasonable speed in having to decide things. And Paul Robin Cook, he died shortly afterwards uh, from a heart attack. So look, what other questions? What about diplomatic skills training? Um, I always give an example of one of the great diplomats, Marilyn Monroe, okay? You didn't know she was a diplomat, did you? Why is she relevant to you diplomats out there, out there or you people who want to become diplomats? Because when Marilyn Monroe came to Hollywood, she was very unsuccessful. She was reduced to doing menial jobs, getting tiny parts. She had all the problems that young actresses often have in Hollywood. What was her response? She learned to sing and she learned to dance and she took acting lessons and she took elocution lessons and she learned about how to dress well. She took dozens of different courses to become a better actress and a better singer and an all round better person to increase her chances. And I think this is very relevant to people in any job, and that includes diplomacy. What are the two kinds of diplomatic training? There's the main two kinds, I would argue, are number one, formal training. So if you can see means to do training, do that. You know, courses like this are good. You can look at my uh, 12 diplomatic lessons I've already mentioned on LinkedIn, have a look through them, uh, have a look at my new book next year when it comes out maybe, have a look at other um, writers on diplomacy. So that's the formal part of it. The informal part of it is study the best of your colleagues, study the great diplomats around you. One of the um, suggestions I make in those diplomatic lessons, it's number three actually is, go for the hard jobs. I say that you should always take the most difficult jobs available, the most stretching jobs, the most challenging jobs. Why should you do that? Because in those jobs, first of all, you will find out what you are capable of when you're completely turbocharged, when you have a limitless amount of work to do. For me, that job perhaps was when I was working on the European community budget and European community um, economic and monetary union back in the late 80s and early 90s, when we were working until three or four o'clock in the morning, night after night, doing briefing. And it was very intense, but I saw some really great diplomats in action. And I learned that I was capable of going much further than I'd ever thought I was. So for me, the idea of diplomatic training is good, but you should combine both your informal training, your on-the-job training, your learning from other people with the more formal training. And you need to do both and think, you know, I may not be as beautiful as Marilyn Monroe, but I can be a great diplomat just as she became a great actress. 
This is related to um, another of the questions on this list, this third list about wisdom, loyalty, and diligence, how to acquire them or pass them on. And Stephanie very cleverly has taken this question from my diplomatic lesson number 11, which was about my letters that I got from the Queen. So when you're a British diplomat, when you um, become or when you became a diplomat back in the 80s, you would get a letter from the Queen congratulating you on becoming a diplomat. And it contains some very old fashioned language. In fact, I've written it down here. It says, whereas it appears to us, to us meaning we the royal family, it's the royal we, whereas it appears to us expedient to nominate some person of industry, fidelity, and knowledge to perform the functions of an office officer of our diplomatic service. So notice those adjectives, industry, working hard, fidelity, being loyal, and knowledge, knowing a lot of stuff. So if you like, that's what the Queen felt that a young diplomat should have. Then when I was appointed an ambassador, I got another letter from the Queen. And this time she said, and I quote, whereas it appears to us expedient to nominate some person of approved wisdom, loyalty, diligence, and circumspection to represent us in the character of our ambassador, extraordinary and plenipotentiary in Vienna. So wisdom, loyalty, diligence, and circumspection. Circumspection means not always being too direct in what you do, being subtle. And then wisdom, you all know what wisdom is, loyalty, same as in a way as fidelity, and diligence, a bit like industry, working hard. So for me, the key traits to become an ambassador are to practice and to learn continuously. For example, I say in my diplomatic no lesson number 12, how to be an ambassador. I say, first of all, you should bear in mind that to be an ambassador is a gigantic privilege. You're standing on the shoulders of giants, all the great ambassadors who came before you. And you should remember that that is a privilege and behave accordingly. Live up to it. The second thing to be an ambassador is that you are the one amongst all the people who are working on whatever you're working on, whether it's the Iran nuclear talks or whether it's the relationship with Vienna or the relationship with uh, Ukraine, you are the person above all who has to have an opinion on that country or that issue. And if the prime minister or the president were to ring up, you are the person who decides that policy. And how do you decide on that policy? By being a good diplomat in the way I described before. And thirdly, to be a great ambassador. My, my view is you should focus on the work you love. This probably applies to any job, but I don't mean you should love everything about being an ambassador. Some, some, some of the things about being an ambassador can be a bit boring or a bit dull, um, but think of what parts of the job you like most and do more of that. And people will see that you're passionate and that you really love the work you're doing. And that will shine through. In my case, when I was ambassador in Kiev in 2009, I was struggling a bit, you know, I was doing the job okay, I was getting good, good appraisals, um, but I thought there must be more I can do. And I had some coaching, a good example of constant learning. I, I had some coaching from um, a coach based in the UK. And she said, well, what do you like doing? What do you like doing most? So I said, well, writing, I've written, I've written several novels. And she said, well, that's good, but um, what in your work could you combine with writing? So I thought about it and scratched my head and I said, well, how about writing a blog? Everybody, this was back in 2009, 12 years ago, blogs were quite new. And she said, yeah, can, could you write a blog? So I began to write a blog and that blog is the longest serving blog in diplomatic history. I wrote it for 12 years, uh, hundreds and hundreds of episodes they're all still there on the Foreign Office website. Uh, you can look at them. And it really made a big difference to my career that I combined writing 
with diplomacy in that way. And as I say, I'm now writing this new book about diplomacy, which um, I'm hoping will gather together all of those lessons. So Stephanie, we have another five minutes. What, what would you like to talk about next? Thank you very much, Ambassador. I was just looking at the chat. Um, so, um, well, first of all, um, I really, I really like the advice. This is one of the advice to share as well to whatever you do, um, you should have a passion for it. Um, if you start your UN career, this already gives you such an advantage at the at the interview um, when drafting your letters, because people can feel, um, your counterparts can feel that you're passionate about it. And you have a natural advantage um, because you just, it's not, it's not work, it's not studying. You actually enjoy reading, you actually enjoy educating yourself on that topic. And that is um, a great advantage. So I, I agree, I would definitely advise anyone. Um, there's a question, for example, master, um, one of the um, participants is asking, I'm a master's student of international relations and diplomacy. What, what courses um, do you suggest me to enroll in? So I could have a better chance of becoming part of the diplomatic sector. Um, Ambassador, maybe um, the answer will be here. Um, those courses you're passionate about, those courses which you enjoy, or do you have some specific advice here? Um, well, it depends very much. I was looking at the chat and I saw people were saying, you know, I'm, for example, I'm, a, I'm studying dip diplomatic practice at university or I'm doing a course in diplomacy and international relations. You know, what should I study to get on? And it will depend very much on the country you're in and the system that you're in. So for example, if you're, uh, if you're a French diplomat, um, you would have to go to the Ecole Sciences Po probably uh, to begin with for several years and then go to the ENA, the Ecole Nationale d'Administration, and then um, go on to uh, take the diplomatic service exams. Whereas in, in Germany, most people are lawyers. Um, in Britain, you can study anything at all and it won't necessarily help you to study international relations. Um, but if you can get through the exam, then you will be a diplomat. So I th my advice to people saying exactly which courses should I take would be take a strong look at your own country's diplomatic service and what they require and see what they recommend, because it may differ by country. Um, for example, in, um, in Germany, you have to speak English as well as German, plus one other UN language to even be eligible. Um, whereas in Britain, you have to take an exam that shows that you know how to learn languages. It doesn't matter if you actually speak any, um, apart from English, of course. Um, but you do need to be able to demonstrate that you can learn languages. And if you get a high score in that so-called language aptitude test, then you might be sent off to learn Chinese with the Foreign Office. If you get a low score, like me, I should say, um, you won't be sent off to learn any extra languages, although I did, I did actually learn a lot of languages despite getting a low score. So take a look at your own diplomatic service and see what they require. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I will um, add something later. Um, do you, I appreciate um, we have to have, I think you will leave us. Um, do you still have one minute or two? I have, or is I have 90 more seconds, so I can ask one more. Answer Wonderful. One more um, maybe um, a last question. You mentioned in your blog that um, diplomacy has been in a state of flux for centuries. So my last question is, who needs diplomats? Is this still a career path suitable for the next generation? Great question. Um, I do think that diplomacy will continue to evolve. Do bear in mind that it's not always glamorous. You spend a lot of time in your own capital, just like any other civil servant. And then when you do go overseas, it's often difficult moving around with your family and so on, if you have a family. Um, at the same time, we will all need diplomats in the future because countries and organizations such as the UN or the EU need to have experts in foreign countries to understand and to influence them. So you're always going to need diplomats. Um, I also think it's important to ensure that diplomats are diverse that you have a good spread of people from different genders, that you have people from different um, ethnic backgrounds, from minorities within whichever country you're in. Uh, for example, in the UK, we now have in the United Kingdom, we have um, all the ambassadors in G7 countries are women, which is a first, um, and several other important ambassadors as well, e.g. at the United Nations. Um, so diplomats, I think, will always be needed. 
If you want to know more, do have a look either at my LinkedIn page or have a look at my robertpim.com website. So just search for Robert Pim, E-I-M-M, -M, and you'll find lots of lots more reflections on this kind of stuff. So thank you all very much for listening to me. I have to go and see a lawyer now. So um, I hope you find that helpful. And do come and say hello to me on LinkedIn anytime. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Bye-bye. Thank you so Bye. much. So we have another um, we have another four minutes. Maybe uh, maybe something here from my side to add. The ambassador has mentioned, or the question was about what to study. That's a question, for example, the United Career Coalition team often receives. What shall I study? What course should I, or what field should I specialize in if I'm interested in a career with the United Nations? So UCC is um, our main advice is for intergovernmental organizations. So unfortunately, if you have questions related to diplomacy, um, I won't be able to answer any of those in the next four minutes. But um, of course, the UN is very closely linked to the work of diplomats. But um, what um, my replies is always, as I said before, um, do something, study something you enjoy. The UN is not one big employer. There are various specialized UN organizations. Um, there are various um, um, UN organizations in various countries. Um, um, there are, and, and it's in every organization, there are different departments that have that look for, diff for people in different areas from finance to HR, to um, admin work, to um, procurement. So there are, um, a lot of opportunities within the UN organizations. So if you are interested in an internet in an inter in a career with an intergovernmental organization, you do not necessarily have to study um, international relations or international development. And I think this is probably what um, maybe along you already started a studying you know, in a different field and you now discovered your interest at the, in the UN. Um, don't don't worry continue to study what you enjoy that would be my advice and there are a lot of opportunities how you can apply what you have learned um, since there are a lot of different UN roles out there um, I will admit one more participant who's joined a bit later um, maybe before um, before I end this webinar some key tips to take away is um, match your diplomatic skills to UN competencies. You saw the slide before with the UN core values and under each UN core values, you have listed some diplomatic skills that match these UN, core, uh, UN competencies. So my advice would be the, really be to focus on these diplomatic skills and um, on those UN competencies. Most, if not all of them that we've listed there are soft and transferable skills. These skills you can you can teach yourself. Um, you can um, you can sign up for a course. You can, for example, get in touch with one of our UN experts and get some advice on how you can train them. Um, but these skills are all skills that you can learn. Um, the other tip: express your motivation and adherence to organizational values. Um, whatever organization you apply for, whether it's the World Bank, whether it's the African Development Bank, whether it's uh, UNICEF, um, make sure you um, do kind of do your homework. Um, make sure you know about their values, you know what's their midterm strategy plan, um, you know about current initiatives. Um, of course, initiatives like the Sustainable Development Goals are always um, Good to know about in more detail when you apply for the UN. But uh, really here, do your homework and understand um, um, the current, uh, the values of the organization. Um, another tip, showcase your understanding of the organization and its purpose, quite similar to the one with understanding the values. Stay focused and stay professional. This um, correlates a bit with what Ambassador Turner has said about um, stay calm, take your time, and um, yeah, my, my former boss always said, stay focused, really um, try, to have, try to have your own career goals. Um, most companies have a business plan, a strategy. Try to have the same for your career. Um, whether this is short, medium or long term, it really helps you to stay focused. Stay, um, yeah, of course, latest developments, as I've already mentioned, latest initiatives, 
such as sustainable development goals or as the ambassador just mentioned diversity and inclusion is a big topic um, so that is always good to know when you when you when you're interested in applying for a role with an intergovernmental organizations and last but not least keep learning and developing new skills. As the ambassador said, in my opinion, um, the best way to keep learning is sometimes just go for an opportunity where that maybe scares you, where you, where you think, I'm not sure whether I can do this job, I'm not sure whether I have the right skills, whether I have the right experience. This is how you grow, this is how you learn, and this is really the best and fastest way to, um, to learn. Um, with that said, um, I really hope that talking about learning and developing skills, I really hope that this free webinar was useful. Um, feel free to sign up for the United Career Coalition newsletter, which is on our website, unitedcareercoalition.org. Um, the newsletter is for free. Um, whenever there are um, new webinars, we will also share that on LinkedIn.